Hello, welcome everyone. At six minutes past 12, um, there's people searching for our, oh, there she is, perfect. Hello. Perfect. <laughs> uh, so we can start, sorry for the delay. Uh, my name is Josje, I work for Save the Children. I'll be your host or moderator, or however you want to call it, uh, for today. We'll be speaking in English because we have, uh, we also have guests from uh, Africa, the continent we're talking about today. Uh, but first, uh, just as a brief introduction, I want to tell you a little bit why Save the Children is actually involved uh, in work around climate justice, because for some it's not a very clear link. Um, and it's of course it starts with children, because we are a child rights organization, uh, and children are not simply miniature human beings. They have very specific needs, they have vulnerabilities, uh, and thus climate change and the effects of climate change uh, make them more vulnerable to the impact. So for example, extreme heat doesn't affect children in the same way that it does adults. Uh, and the recognition of these special uh, needs has led to the establishment of the Convention uh, on the Rights of the Child already in 1989. And for Save the Children, these children's rights are at the core of everything that we do. Um, and last summer, the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child, so that's the body that's responsible for upholding the convention, uh, published a new guiding document uh, with an interpretation between uh, the linkages between climate change and children's rights. Uh, in legal terms, we call this document the General Comment 26, which says basically nothing. But now you know if people are talking about the General Comment 26, they talk about the link between children's rights and climate change. And what does this mean exactly? It explains how their rights are threatened, such as the right to survival, adequate housing, uh, standard of living, but also their right to play, for example. I'm very happy today that we'll be joined by two children from uh, Nigeria and Sierra Leone, and their stories will illuminate what I'm telling you now. Uh, but they're also enabling rights, such as education and participation. And to understand the causes and effects of climate change uh, make for a better prepared and more capable young adults who can then continue the struggle uh, to fight climate change. But children are not only victims, they're agents of change. And we have seen this in the recent years. Movements such as Fridays for Future have kept us alert and sharp kept it high on the political agenda. Uh, and it's not only their right to be heard, it is a necessity. If you want to do better for the children today and to s uh, secure a livable planet for their future. And with that, I would like to give the floor. Uh, we have some technical issues with, um, from Sierra Leone, so you might not be able to see them, but we know we can hear them. But because maybe we can start with Miranda, from, who's joining us from Nigeria, you can see her on the screen. Uh, Miranda, take it away. Good morning, everyone. My name is Miranda Stanley. I'm 11 years old. I'm a girl champion for Save the Children International in Nigeria. I'm also a deputy coordinator of the girls-led movement in Nigeria. I create content for advocacy for child rights, specifically for the girl child. I experienced firsthand an extreme climate event, which occurred on June 23rd, 2023 in Abuja. That day, residents of the city witnessed a heavy downpour of rain for nearly four hours. This led to a severe flood that overwhelmed residential neighborhoods. In an estate called Trademore, close to where I live, many people were trapped. Kids who were in the school at the time could not go home when the school time ended. It was sad to watch many houses and cars submerged underwater. Many families, including children, were trapped in their houses. Media reports stated that some people were drowned, others were displaced, seeking shelter elsewhere. Properties were damaged beyond recovery. Since my home is not far from Trademore, I had a general feeling of fear for long after. 
after that dreadful day, I fear floods would come again and swallow my houses, affecting me and my family. I still live in fear and uncertainty. I have realized that the climate in Abuja is changing rapidly. We know we now experience high level of heat. I don't look forward to the extreme heat as the city becomes so uncomfortable. I find it difficult to concentrate at school or read my books during this period. There are no air conditioners or fans in our classrooms. Many children like me across Nigeria face the devastating effects of climate crisis. This has affected the rights of children to education, to good health, and the right to be safeguarded from all harm. In Northeast Nigeria, children face scary sandstorms yearly. The experience is equally scary. Suddenly, the sky turns dark and windy. Trees are uprooted. The experience results in cars which park by the roadside. Children with breathing difficulties are worst hit. In the northwestern part of Nigeria, wind erosion sweeps away houses and farms, intensifying the effects of deforestation, droughts, overgrazing, and desertification. In many communities of the Sahel region of Nigeria, we have sparse vegetation. With the drying of the Lake Chad, Families who are dependent on the lake have lost their source of livelihood. The water from the lake was used for irrigation and for quenching the thirst of animals. Fishing was a major livelihood activity. All this has ended with the drying up of the lake. In the southern part of Nigeria, unpredictable and the intense rainfall results to flooding. Many families lose their farmlands and are displaced. Oil spill in the Niger Delta state has degraded the coastal environment, impacting negatively on livelihoods. Human-induced activity, like indiscriminate disposal of waste, has resulted in the blockage of public drainages. This is partly responsible for the flooding that occurs in highly populated areas of the country. Many families and their children are affected by droughts. This leads to serious hazards to livestock and crops. Drought continues to threaten livelihoods, increases the risk of disease and death. Water scarcity impacts so many children on their well being and survival. Climate change is happening to all of us world leaders, donors, civil society, governments at all levels communities, families, and most importantly, children must act now. No one should be left behind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miranda. Thank you so much. Um, Aminata, are you there? Now we don't even hear anything. We're expecting Aminata to say something. Ah, I think, or is something happening? We cannot hear, see you, but I, th I thought we could hear you before. Oh, this is a shame. Maybe we can do, um, which I actually should have done in the beginning. <laughs> but uh, let's do the Menti first. So I'm gonna ask uh, the audience, um, and also uh, people from the technique, uh, if they can pull up. Yes, go to. The, if you, you all know the drill, right? I don't know how. Maybe it's become this like boring thing now, but it's a good to know kind of like the level of, of knowledge and also just some basically some shocking facts to share with you. Um, so go to menti.com, please, uh, on your phones and type in the code six eight zero eight five seven eight. So that's six eight zero eight. 57.8. And I'll wait. So the first question you can already see on the on the screen. What percentage of children is exposed to climate or environmental shocks globally? First. Okay. Okay. Interesting. This is going quite fast, actually. 
it's still moving, so I'm giving you a few more seconds. Okay, well, um, 12 percent, 12 people, 13, 14, all right. <laughs> The, the, those latest ones that already heard me say 12 and then thought, oh, okay, that's the answer. Um, yeah, it's 99% of children. Um, that's basically everyone. Then the next question, how much school enrollment rates declined across Africa in response to droughts? This is a tougher one. <laughs> I think I think a lot of people are influenced by the by the last question. It's actually twenty percent, which is still one in five, um, and that's a huge number. And that's happening now. Next question. Sorry for those who are uh, <laughs> didn't get to answer. But uh, how many children are living in countries where extreme risk of climate change is threatening their lives? Is that two hundred fifty million, five hundred million, or one billion? You see how, how the question before is always kind of influencing, right? But we did this on purpose, obviously, because th it's not what you think. <laughs> uh, it's actually one billion, and this is one in two children globally. Um, so that's, uh, that's yeah, mind-boggling. And then the last question, how many, mo how many more heat waves will a child born in 2020 experience compared to their, basically, their grandparents? Uh, so two and a half more times, four times more heat waves, or seven times more heat waves. And now I think, wow, what the, okay, I thought they were being anonymous. Anonymous, but yeah, this is actually this is uh, the right answer. It's seven seven times more heat waves, uh, and this is a global average. So it depends a bit on the region. Um, but for the continent of Africa, it's it's also close to seven times. So it's actually quite uh, they're quite on the global average. Um, Okay, that was actually the, the little quiz I wanted to share with you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and then maybe we can try to go back to see if our Sierra Leone office has sound. Aminata, are you there? I'm a bit afraid that Miranda is going to do have to represent all the children of Africa on her own. <laughs> Ah, she can do that. You can see it. <laughs> All right, let's move forward. Um, I would like to welcome uh, the panelists who are in this room uh, to the stage. Uh, Marike Koekoek from Volt, everyone. <laughs> Susanne Kreuger from GroenLinks. <laughs> and Eva Fleming from uh, World Youth for Climate Justice. Thank you and welcome. And um, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk in this one. Give you this one if that's okay for you. And I know Miranda wants to do one. Yep. Share. Um, maybe first introduce yourself to Miranda, because I don't think she knows. We the familiar faces for us, <laughs> but uh, not for everyone. So hi, I'm Rene. Uh, my name is Marieke Koekoek. Uh, apologies for arriving uh, late. I was downstairs at the debate and I wasn't particularly watching the time. Apologies. Um, um, I'm a member of parliament right now for the party Volt. Uh, Volt is a pan-European uh, political party. Um, and I'm also number two for this list. So hopefully after next Wednesday, I will still be a member of parliament, but we don't know that yet. Uh, what, what else do you want to... I think that's okay. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> Suzanne. Hi, Miranda. Hi. Is, this, uh, is it working? I don't know. I, I don't think so. No, yeah. it's not working. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Miranda. Hi, I'm, my name is Susanne. Um, I'm a member of parliament for the Green Party and the Social Democrats, so green and red together. Uh, and I have uh, twins. I'm a mother and I have twins of your age. And they also really worry about climate change. Um, so I think that's something that uh, children across the globe have in common. Thank you. Eva. Uh, hi, my name is Eva Fleming. Uh, I'm with World Youth for Climate Justice, and we uh, aim to bring. Uh, we started a campaign to bring 
climate change to the UN Court, the I International Court of Justice, which is located in The Hague and uh, started by the Pacific, supported by young people around the world, and we were successful, and now the case is um, has started and all countries can participate, and we're advocating specifically for children and young people to be a part of these proceedings. Thank you so much. Uh, this microphone is supposed to be working when you talk into it. Yes. Okay. Here you go. <laughs> Thank you so much and welcome again. I'm very happy to be here and I'm very honored and also a bit proud that you said yes to a conversation uh, directly with African children because that doesn't happen often enough. Um, so I first would actually like to ask you just to respond to the, the story that you heard uh, from Miranda and what she was describing. Uh, first thoughts or first responses. I'm going to start in the middle now. Well, thanks uh, for, for sharing uh, your experiences with us, Miranda, and with everybody here in the Netherlands. Um, I think it's really important to hear firsthand what effects uh, climate change already have on people. Because often um, people think climate change is something that's far away, and it's, uh, it's far away also in the time, it's future. Well, right now, at this moment, uh, a lot of people, and especially children, are already um, being affected. And I was curious to hear from you, um, it, do you talk about this with your friends or kids at school often? Is this something that, that yeah, you talk with other children about? Um, not all the time. Sometimes I talk about it with my friends when we have free time or go to the library. So I talk with them sometimes. Yeah, I think that's very healthy. <laughs> yeah. but I was wondering, because you're really active, you're here with us today telling your story. Uh, but but uh, um, how do you say, the, the situations that you described, it affects a lot of children. Do you feel that older children also have the, the ways to be active like you, or how, how does it work? Um, I don't really know what to say. <laughs> it's okay, you don't you, have to answer. I still pay for the question. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so you are really active on this topic because you're here today with us and you're uh, an ambassador on this topic. But if you talk with other children, do they feel that they can, how do you say, influence this? Or do they feel like, oh, why does other the, the rest of the world don't do much more about climate change? Some feel like it's very important while Others, maybe they may not take it a bit seriously. They may just feel I'm disturbing them about it. So most of my friends do think about it and they wonder why the world is not doing anything about it. But the others don't care. Yeah, that's a good question. Marika, do you want to respond to? Yeah, uh, well, first off, by, by saying thank you for sharing your story uh, and also so strongly and so clearly i have uh, three kids who are somewhat younger than you and i i would be really proud when they're your age that they can voice their case so so clearly and strongly um what uh, what i took away from your story is also that at least it sounds like we in europe are affecting often the problems that you have to deal with so for example what you described about the pollution that's nearby your uh, home uh, that is something i think that comes directly or indirectly from europe and um, also what you described about not being able to read your books because of the uh, high heat and not having an air conditioning in your house. Um, that made me also uh, quite sad to hear. Um, when I was 11, I didn't have to struggle with these things. And I don't know if, if, that's, the, if, if, if that's okay with you, but I, what I also want to ask you something about um, what you feel is lacking or what we as politicians or in, in Europe or what we are not doing uh, enough or uh, what we should do better. Uh, to help you in your life? Uh, I would recommend using solar panel energy and planting more trees. Yes. And that, that actually well. helps the children here as well yeah. because yeah. Uh, we also uh, struggle with heat waves sometimes. We've seen this last September, very odd, suddenly a heat wave in September. Yeah, so more trees also helps our schools. Yeah. Not only indirectly getting the fossil fuels out of the air or the CO. Uh, Eva, do you want to respond? Yeah, thank you so much for sharing, um, Miranda. And I think 
uh, some of the points that I picked up from your story is that how much um, climate change is uh, the way it's affecting children and I think also the strong link with human rights and children's rights and uh, Josh, in your introduction you also mentioned the uh, child's rights uh, covenant and I think these kinds of um, it's so important that we kind of connect, keep connecting back to if it means when you're in school and you're affected by extreme weather events, that that impacts your right to education or your right to um, to to life. And I think there are so many, change has to come from so many different ways. And I think kind of through uh, the political system is one way, through civil society is another way. And I think a really big opportunity is also the, the legal pathway that and, uh, courts are so important in the in kind of in the climate fight as well and there are currently 19 cases around the world uh, on children's rights and climate change so i think that's really hopeful and also um more um uh, more cases are coming for example also the inter uh, the um sorry the african court on human and people's rights has also uh, there's also a strong call from civil society now to start a, c a case um at this court and i think it would be so essential for children to be a key key in the outcome, but also key in the process of requesting it and uh, making sure that uh, states uphold the obligations that they have under international law. And I think kind of your story shows so much how the two are so interconnected. And it's not law isn't about kind of a legal abstract, but it's about making sure that when you go to school, that your you can realize your rights and um, you can um, yeah grow up enjoying uh, all these rights that you have. So. Um, I think maybe my question to you is uh, how do you think you, uh, what is needed for you to be able to um, exercise another right, uh, which is the right to participate in decisions that affect you? Um, so how, what, what is needed for you to be able to, to use your voice and to be a part of the decisions that will affect your life and the lives of future generations? Did you get the question, Miranda? No, please, can you repeat it? <laughs> There's a lot of words. <laughs> so my question to you is, uh, what's needed for you to be a part of the decisions that affect your life? It's a difficult question. Yeah. Probably, uh, we need help. We need donations. We need grants. We need um probably funds for african countries like nigeria yeah yeah so and maybe um there's going to be the big climate summit next month so would that be something that we actually should have children there actually talking to all the world leaders saying okay hey this is what needs to happen because it's our future and uh, you better do something Yes, probably those who can understand English and then us, we can easily interpret for those who don't understand English. We can tell them what do they want us to do for them to improve their stand standard of life, yeah, standard of living. And this is actually, uh, it is happening. Uh, I mean, Ife joined as a youth representative also in the Dutch delegation two years ago. Uh, so if it knows about it, but also especially for children who are under 18, uh, there have been efforts to get them to the, the COP, the big climate summits. Uh, and this year, it's a shame that uh, Aminata from Sierra Leone, she actually participated in the African climate summit already. Uh, and uh, Save Children has been trying to get her also on the children's delegation. Uh, but I'm, I don't think we managed uh, for Aminata, unfortunately. Uh, so it is. Th there is an increasing awareness, fortunately, uh, but we do see that uh, a lot. And maybe if we can elaborate a bit further after, um, that the we kind of require children to speak the language of the policymakers mm -hmm. instead of the other way around. And this is a ma massive barrier, which we uh, which is doesn't cost us anything to try to uh, break down. But if what is your experience? Yeah, uh, that's so recognizable, and I think also uh, what's so important is that we remain the we re uh, remain the focus on engaging young people and children, not only around these international moments when uh, world leaders come together. There's a lot of attention from the international media, but also in between 
uh, and not only in between cups, but actually throughout all these dis different decision-making processes that affect children's and young people's lives. And I think making sure that, um, of course, uh, you know, r children have to speak to world leaders and hold them accountable and make uh, you know, make your voice voice heard. And at the same time, also making sure that. Um, <coughs> that decisions before they are before they're decided so not only once a decision is made and then you consult young people or children but really from the start from the decision making process make sure that children young people have a seat at the table and i think that's where there's still so much to be gained and i think um really ma making sure that we don't only we're not only cheering for kind of the the photo moments at these big conferences but really the the participation in between just to give an example of that, we had, um, um, I don't know, 100% sure if I pronounce her name correctly, but Vanessa Nakate from uh, Uganda, she was in the Netherlands, and we tried to organize a session in Parliament uh, to, to have her voice and her stories be heard in uh, Dutch Parliament. And unfortunately, that uh, didn't get enough support of the majority of the Parliament to, to be able to organize that. So I think there's still a big, um, how do you say, that that the need to hear first-hand experiences and stories mm -hmm. is still not being perceived enough, I think, as really valuable, where a lot of, well, a lot of members of parliament maybe think, okay, I'll read the report or I'll, I don't know, <laughs> do whatever. While it's, of course, the first-hand experience of, of especially young women who are currently being affected by the impacts of climate change. Um, yeah, it makes it a lot more urgent and uh, it creates a bigger appeal. Um, it, we have elections coming up. Uh, <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um, and of course, so I do want to ask you a little bit about the, you know, the political views and and what your, your plans are. Uh, you know, in the in the in, in when it comes to climate justice and children. Um, just maybe f first of all, like if you would enter government or a coalition in the government, what would the first steps be to address? some of the things we've been talking about today. Marike, can I give you the floor? Uh, yeah, sure. Though I was just saying, uh, there's a bigger chance that my <laughs> colleague will be in government than me, if you look at the polls, but... Uh, stay optimistic. Absolutely. <laughs> no, no, that, <laughs> and opposition is also a good thing. Uh, anyway, I think the, the first thing that I would like to change is, um, and that, that has a lot to do, I think, also with the Dutch approach to politics. In the last weeks in the campaign, we saw that there were many really important topics being discussed but they were all very much focused on the Netherlands and they were not focused on Europe and not at all on the rest of the world. And that amazes me because I think when we look at the main challenges for humankind, the climate crisis, um, rising injustice, growing injustice, those things are not things that we can solve here in the Netherlands alone. So that is the thing that I would change, um, the, the, as, as the first thing that I would like to change is that we look beyond mm -hmm. the postal stamp that is the Netherlands and that we manifest ourselves in uh, the rest of the world. Thank you. Suzanne. Yeah, I think I would make the decision that climate justice becomes really the focus of our climate uh, policy. I think uh, a lot of our climate policy is focused more on the technological solutions or just on CO2 uh, reduction, but not on the real justice questions uh, behind it, which is, of course, within the Netherlands, where uh, the bigger emitters don't pay enough taxes and uh, uh, poor people uh, are suffering high energy prices. But it's also especially, of course, a global issue. And I think for us, it's important that the Netherlands really step up their game in climate ambition because it's a fair share that we have to take in solving the climate crisis. But it's also about uh, providing the funds to help countries uh, that are already impacted by climate change in dealing with it. Uh, and one of the things uh, on, on, on this conversation particularly that we um, put forward a proposal to make gender equality really part of the international climate strategy. Again, unfortunately, a proposal that didn't make it in Parliament, but hopefully after the elections that is something that would uh, get a majority. Because I think it's really important that we stop looking at climate just from sort of a CO2 reduction perspective, but also look at really from the justice and equality perspective. Yeah, yeah I think it's very interesting also you raised gender equality. Uh, and Miranda didn't mention it in her speech, but I know in our previous conversations she did talk about it. 
uh, how you know these like failure of of crops and and and, and you know um, higher in, uh, higher poverty rates also leads to girls being getting you know wed at an early age so to relieve financial pressures on the family um so yeah the gender the gender aspect is is, is also very relevant miranda do you Power want aspect. yeah miranda do you want to elaborate a little bit um, why it's yes. why it's specifically important for girls it was probably because of their education, their parents may not be able to send them to school. So they are giving out to marry so that they reduce the financial burden of their family and there's one less mouth to feed in the family. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very sad truth. Yeah. I, I think when I look at policy, um, policy makers, uh, we discussed how the views of children are not all, very often not incorporated. But when I look at how we view um, the taking of, uh, tec tackling of the climate crisis, we often don't think about what it does to uh, humankind as a whole. So we don't look at the inequalities that we increase or that we build. And last year I visited uh, Rwanda as part of the committee on, on foreign affairs, of, uh, for, sorry, foreign trade and, and development uh, cooperation. And what I saw there is, for example, uh, a small thing that can already help building equality, uh, namely making sure that mothers can work and children are taken care of. That's a project that they've developed there. And I think when it comes to the climate crisis, we only increase the inequalities that are already there when it comes to boys and girls, when it comes to young women and young men. Yeah, very right. Yeah. Um, and um, I also wanted to ask a bit, because Miranda mentioned it already, uh, she said we need grants. And there's a whole that's not some like uh, that's not a randomly chosen word, of course, because um, we need the money is needed, obviously, for climate adaptation, loss and damage, and such things. But these countries are usually already in huge debt, mm -hmm. um, so loans are not the answer. And can you explain a bit how your party feels uh, in this regard? Should climate finance? be additional to the already existing development budget? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. No, I, yeah, I think it's really strongly, um, yeah, that climate justice, it, it, it's funding for climate justice. And uh, yeah, I think it's important we, uh, we allocate funds for that. And then besides of that, there's the whole loss and damage discussion. So I think it's also important to separate the two. Yeah. Um, and politically, um, in the international climate summits, loss and damage is still a really complicated subject because, uh, well, yeah, it's, it's about owning up, it's about taking responsibility, and that's really, I think, the key of climate justice. But um, so the, the, the climate funds, we also, also put in our proposal, um, yeah, a big additional fund, additional to development. Yeah. Maybe just, just to be sure, I'm pretty sure that we have a very informed audience, but when we talk about loss and damage, yeah, we, uh, basically uh, everything that Miranda was describing in your story, uh, the damage that uh, climate change, uh, the climate crisis is already uh, wrecking upon the world in terms of flooding and heat and wildfires, uh, but also slow onset damage, like loss of education. Um, th this is the, the things we talk about when we talk about loss and damage. Yeah, which is different from funding for adaptation right. or funding for clean technology transfer or well, other funding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I fully agree. Um, we have a tendency, and we policymakers, I mean, uh, to to step or allocate money for something and then use that money for completely different things. So the <laughs> development cooperation budget in the Netherlands is used for. Uh, um, asylum care here in, the, here in the Netherlands. So we spend our budget that is meant for people abroad, we spend it here. That's weird. Uh, and I'm being polite. Uh, we also use it to tackle the climate crisis. And I think that is also strange because you should focus on um, development cooperation and climate and climate justice. That has nothing to do with that. It has, uh, has something to do with historical injustices and it has something to do with future, hopefully, justices. So uh, that should be separate. And uh, I think it's a good step that we've now politically, internationally agreed that there should be something like an international climate fund, that in Europe we've done this the same. Um, but now we have to 
make sure that that money is well spent and that it is not going to other things. Uh, and so in that sense, the Netherlands is a bad example. We should not follow our lead. We should follow other countries' leads. Um, because it should go to you know being able to go to school to have something simple as air conditioning because otherwise we're only going to increase future injustices. Yeah, maybe to add to that, last year I was at the climate summit and uh, I spoke to a lot of um, youth representatives and uh, youth activists and uh, gender um, equality activists, and a big fear I felt was that people are afraid that the money will not actually go to the communities that are really affected, because often those communities are within a country also um, already uh, marginalized groups. So uh, yeah, there's a risk that you would only have funding at a, at a state level and that you don't actually reach communities. Yeah. Which is and why the fund shouldn't be hosted by the World Bank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, and this is a big, I think a big question is how do we really uh, reach uh, impacted communities uh, directly? Um, and, and what's the role, uh, uh, well, for civil society organizations in that to be able to do that? If I'm, I'm kind of curious, what do, you, what do you think about when you listen to this? I think what's, um, I think I, I agree with what you're both saying about kind of taking responsibility, making sure we keep looking abroad and not only uh, inwards when tackling this crisis. And I think there is, um, I think there is the tendency to when, um, yeah, when things get difficult to focus more internally, but I think we have to, and I think all of us play a role, can play a role in that, make sure that we remember uh, who are the big emitters and uh, how did we get into this crisis? And also what lessons can we take from there to make sure that the way when we find our way out of this crisis, we um, we don't make the same mistakes again. And I think um, what's I so I'm really glad that you're hosting this uh, this event, and also that um, you know organizations like Ch Save and other NGOs keep putting um, child and youth participation on the agenda because I think uh, children and youth have been such a, a, a uh, such a driver of holding states accountable um, and. I hope, really hope that in the coming years we're able to, you know, like give give young people and children a stronger voice to make sure that we don't make the same mistakes and that policy is made uh, is made a participatory basis. Yeah. Do you have any recommendations, or do you see opportunities for the MPs uh, where they can actually help to improve this? Yeah, definitely. I think um, three things are important. I think um, first of all. Uh, of course, we we can only solve this if we stop emitting um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And I think, um, yeah, making sure that all countries, and especially the Netherlands and the EU, uh, really cut down on greenhouse ga gas emissions drastically, stop funding fossil fuel subsidies. I think that really should be number one priority. And I think alongside that, when making policies, making sure that children and young people are a part of these decisions, because as it's become so clear um, children and young people are the ones who are the most affected by these decisions. Um, and thirdly, also to keep having an eye for vulnerable groups and that is when it comes to climate change, that's uh, children are the, research has shown that children are the ones who are most affected because of their particular, um, yeah, their vulnerabilities in growing up. Uh, but there are also of course other groups um, in the Netherlands and abroad who are um, more affected by uh, by climate change. So making sure that policies keep an eye on these groups, um, I think it's really important as well. Thank you. Before, I, I see already a hand. Yeah, we're gonna open uh, for to the floor in a minute. I just wanna ask Miranda if she has any more questions for the panel. No. No? <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, I, there was already a hand. Actually, yeah, we're going to open uh, for Q&A right now. Uh, it's uh, in the back. I don't know. Yeah, there's a microphone coming. <laughs> uh, can you stand up and say your name, please? Um, of course. My name is, oh, I can't stand. Uh, Bintu. I didn't have a question for the panelists, but I was wondering if the other girl is going to get a chance to speak. Yeah. The <laughs> we tried. Um, unfortunately, first, uh, just before we started, we could hear them. Uh, yeah. So we thought, okay, we cannot see them. We can hear them. But unfortunately, also the sound seems to have disappeared. So yeah, because there was a message I saw that she was online now. But okay, sure I, I'm gonna there. check with the uh, tech. 
Hello, everyone. Oh, that's really sad. Ah, that's really sad. Yeah. Oh. Aminata, are you there? Yes, ma. Oh. Thank we you. are in luck. Well, yeah, sorry, thank you. Nina. Thank you for the question. Aminata, please um, share your story. Um, good afternoon, once more, everyone. So I'm Aminata from Sierra Leone. So the story I have for climate change is that it's really affecting kids in Sierra Leone. So a few days ago, we had a COP stimulation where we visited few communities in my country that were affected during the heavy rainfall in our country. So we got a lot of information from the kids that were directly affected and the ones that are indirectly affected. So we get to know that it's because of the cutting down of trees, the breaking of stones, and also because of they don't have drainages where the water will actually go down. And they actually, they are that, they have those beans, they have to throw that everywhere where they're living. And also we had another one we are in, if the government have a line, a uh, exact place that no one should build in there. They usually try to see how best do we build that thing and then try to enter into those places and also try to build houses because they want to live. So it has been affecting the kids by education because when the heavy rain comes, the road get damaged, Bridges got break. All the kids are unable to go to school for one year, some two years. Some will never go to school again. They will try to engage themselves in other things that are not necessary. And the health aspect. So we get to know that kids become mentally unstable and also their health is not good. And this is one thing that has been affecting them. So one of the things that we are requesting and we are saying is the fact that they just want to see how best they are going to be the ones planting more trees and doing the energies which they are doing as kids in their community after each disaster and each outbreak. Because for us kids in Sierra Leone, what we believe is the fact that we are not the one that actually damages. We actually came and then we met this and we want to protect our environment so that it will be safe and be safer for we tomorrow. And that's one of the reasons why we are embarking on this. And also we talk about livelihood. The the burning of that here and there is actually affecting the agriculture in our land. And and so for us to have food to eat, it's really not easy. So whenever this outbreak or disaster happens, kids will have to eat maybe once a week, or sometimes a day, depending on what they see, or some have to go to the streets to actually beg. So these were most of the things that most of them go through. Why some of them usually lost their hands, some they become orphan, some actually they're unable to do a lot of other things. They become mentally uh, unstable about the whole issue because they are now orphans. They don't have no one to take care of them. Some wants to be lawyers, they want to be doctors, but no support for them to go to school because of climate change, the way we as humans have get ourselves involved, it's actually worsening it every day. Now we're in a dry season where we're experiencing more, which is a threat to school going people that are unable to go to school now. And exams are fast approaching for the first time. And kids are not going to school are missing a lot and they have to go to write their exam and it's really really, really unsafe for them out there on the road and so much more thank you thank you aminata <clears throat> thank you so much aminata have you been able to listen to the conversation yes i had just few Okay. Because we're having some network issues. Yeah. I heard you were talking about, I, I don't know if I was, I'm really sure about it, was it mitigation and finance as well to see mm -hmm. how best the crisis can be limited and how best they can develop, they have international finance for climate change. And for my own opinion, is the fact that since climate change is now a global concern, because we know how kids have been affected. In Sierra Leone, kids are affected in different ways. Other counties, kids are also affected. And 
when we went to the Africa Climate Summit for Kenya, that was one thing we learned from our colleagues and our peers from different county, which makes it to be a very serious concern that indeed we the children are the ones that suffer a lot because our parents are elderly people, they are very energetic. When this halfway happens, they, they will find a way to escape. For us, we are young, we think it's maybe those fire um, bombs or flies that are happening will be safe, we want to go there to see for ourselves because we think it's safe. So what I have been doing as a, as a champion in my county and also as a child is to make sure that I get the stories of all of these kids. I make sure that we all embark on ski planting, we embark on building the energies that are needed. Because one thing we are tired of is we are tired of losing our peers. We cannot be called leaders of tomorrow and they're not doing anything. Indeed, they're actually doing their best to see how they can tackle it, but there's no monitoring, there's no assessment. So these are things that are really affecting us because as kids, we don't have voice. And now that we have platforms like this to speak up, we don't really want to speak when we learn, we'll go back to our community and start doing something. So that's one thing I have been doing to share the information to my peers. Get them involved in this fight because it's our fight and only us can make it safe and safer for each and every kid in my county and each and every kid in different countries across the world. Yeah. I think you said something very important there. Um, the hypocrisy a little bit, right? The, yeah. We see the youth as uh, the leaders of tomorrow, but we don't invest in them um, and we don't grant them access. Uh, to these decision-making spaces. Um, I'm looking a little bit at the time. Aminata, do you still have a question yourself for the for one of the panelists? No? No, I don't have for now because you know I was having some issues. So yeah, I understand. But I would just want to say a last thing is the fact that. I noticed through the conversation that they are from a political side. So which means, uh, so what I want to say is, please listen to our voices, get children involved and work with them and also work for them. So anything that concerns kids, when something happens, you need to watch there, get there because you back of your mind, just know that when something happens, the kids will suffer a lot. The kids have a lot more to suffer because you cannot have a leader tomorrow that is mentally unstable. This is the time you make sure they're mentally stable, make sure they're healthy, make sure they're educated, make sure they have the necessary information and make sure you involve them in activities that we develop the country. So they will get to know, they will get used to it. They will see it as, this is my duty, this is my responsibility as citizen and as a leader, not something that, anyways, let them go and do it. So that's just short thing I just wanted to say. Get them involved, listen to their words. And when you make commitments, please, please, please make sure you work towards it. That's why when they say something, try to do evaluation on all what they said before you come out and make commitments. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, walk the talk, uh, as we say. Um, we have five more minutes, and I, I do want to give an opportunity to the audience to ask questions. Please bear in mind, you can also ask a question to Miranda or Aminata. My name is Jan Druisnes. Um My question to you is, can you inform the public in detail about activities of Save the Children in with the children there? <laughs> If I do that in detail, I don't think we'll be done in a few <laughs> minutes. Um, yes, but I, I would I would love to. We do a lot. Um, but maybe is it okay if we talk about it a bit further after the session? Everyone is also welcome. We also have a website. Uh, sorry, sorry to be that person. Uh, but savechildren.nl slash climate also tells you a lot. But I'm happy to talk to you also after uh, about what we do exactly. Can, can I just give one compliment? Because I've been only in Parliament for two and a half years. Save the Children has been extremely helpful and resourceful uh, also towards the Parliament. So that's a great thank you to you. I, I can actually return the compliment because uh, 
uh, Marie Cook was one of the few uh, MPs, uh, s together with Suzanne Kreuger, of course, that actually uh, raises the issue of children's rights. Um, so thank you to you too. Um, any other questions? Hey, uh, my name is Sam Van Loon, and I'm really happy to be here. Um, and I have been working in Sierra Leone, actually, so I am also appreciate Aminata's presence. I hope you did do fine, Aminata. Um, and I have worked there with children also a lot, uh, also to mitigate uh, climate change. And I have seen that children are very motivated there to plant trees and to clean the drainage, for example, uh, what Aminata also was saying. But I also feel they felt really left alone, actually, by the government and even uh, by the Ministry uh, of, uh, of Climate, for example. Um, how can we, and I know that you also already said something about that, but how can we um, bridge that gap? Because I know, like, we are talking about, uh, about government also in Europe, but also we have to think about the government in Africa, because I know children feel alone there by their own government. So how can we work, uh, yeah, but how can we work about that? I also think maybe Aminata uh, can answer first. Aminata, did you hear the question? Yes, ma'am. So that's fact that we have been left out. But now we actually somehow feel the info because we have NGOs like Save the Children that make sure that this campaign of climate change is fully child-led. So what we want you to do is come visit, come to see, support us give us the mental support the financial support the emotional support we need to embark on these things because whenever we have to ask our leaders for help it's very hard they will prolong the process and we have energy now to embark on this so that the next coming when it sees you know so we won't be affected like the way we did we want less or no disaster to happen the next coming winning season. So the more they prolong it, the more we relax, the more we get tired. So we just need your support, your financial support, your mental support, your emotional support. Come and guide us as we embark on this fight because we are tired. The loss of life, property, our education, our rights are being deprived because of these disasters. So if you come, just like I'll say that you should have given us the opportunity to voice out our pain, our cries and also embark on the things we believe we should do to make sure that we mitigate our um, climate change crisis in our country. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's also, we, we've been talking a lot about how we want to involve children in decision making, but let's not forget their children. Um, and they should be free from these kind of worries and anxieties. And they should just be able to play outside when they want to. And, you know, they're already going to school and we're actually not only are they being impacted, but they they spend their free time now uh, advocating us adults uh, to keep our promises. Um, so uh, do you want to respond as well to the question? It's not an easy question, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> ma ma maybe in, in addition to what was said, um, um, that, that, that we need to be present. Uh, but perhaps we can't always, I mean, as, as members of parliament, you can't always be abroad, but uh, at least in our minds, we need to be present. So when we develop policies, not only think about from where we are standing, but from where others are standing, especially from where children are standing. And, and I think uh, what we can concretely already do in, in policies is that when we, uh, when we discuss the big funds that are usually not reached by those that are most vulnerable, um, what we can do is, for, for example, to add a condition that uh, civil society is way more involved. Because when you go to countries, um, people underground know a lot more than what we know from our drawing tables here in, in, in The Hague. Um, and that, I think, should be part of how we spend money, is that we, um, we, st we establish conditions on how it's being spent and not just um, for, for countries to show accountability. That's not what I mean, but conditions to who gets to decide where the money goes because who decides is the one who is in power and we should empower people actually in those countries on the ground. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, yeah, I think one of the, the things that Aminata said was really strong um, 
walk with us and walk for us. So yeah, really uh, take a lead to really ensure that children's rights are much better incorporated, but also walk with us, so do it together. And I think uh, one of the big struggles is that, well, at the moment, a lot of the funding goes to governments and, and children or other vulnerable groups are not really directly um, uh, being able to, to um, address that funding or to be involved in how the money is spent. So I think a big challenge is that we ensure that the money really goes to the most impacted communities uh, as directly as possible. So that means setting conditions. But this is even, the, the horrible thing is, this is not only internationally an issue, but also within the Netherlands. So yeah, getting funding to actually people who need it the most uh, is, is the key uh, objective, I think, in climate justice. I'm, I'm looking at the time. We're running a bit late. Uh, so I want to just one, we also started a bit late. So, and I know there's lunch after, so I, I hope you don't mind if we just run five minutes over time because and then I want to give one more person the possibility to ask, ask a question and then maybe Miranda can close. Hi. Uh, hi, my name is Martin. It's reassuring to see these two young ladies from Africa, Miranda and I'm in Hatha. Thank you and <laughs> uh, it's a privilege to hear young people like you advocating for climate change. My question to the two politicians here, you know, the political climate in Europe and the Northern Hemisphere at the moment is very heated with immigration. And let's talk about the causes of migration, especially from Sub-Saharan Africa, which in my view, and I'm sure most people in this room and save the children will agree with me, has been caused partly by climate crisis. To just illustrate this point, those of you who travel to Africa, if you travel to Africa through KLM or airlines like Lufthansa and you watch the screen, you see the devastating impact of climate change. People's lives are being affected. I was born in Ghana and I'm a testament to this. However, unfortunately, or fortunately, or whatever you can call it, some politicians in the West does not, let me be polite a little bit, seems to think about the, the bigger picture of what is going on. They seem to be very populist and inward appeal to the populate and the voters. So my question to you, the two politicians, how do you create a political space for open, honest, and objective debate for the voters and the general public to have honest and reflective insight looking about this crisis? which is not only affecting Africa, because what is affecting Africa is also equally affecting Europe and Netherlands as well. That's my question. Thank, Thank you. you. It's not an easy question, but I'll turn to... It's a really big question. Well, I think, again, um, I, I, I really uh, recognize a lot of what you describe about how the whole debate in, in, in the Netherlands and Europe around migration has become fully toxic and fully uh, hijacked by populism. Um, and for me, it's both about climate justice, so about the justice aspect of um, countries that have created the crisis, the climate crisis, owning up and taking responsibility, and about having a really um, a justice-based discussion about migration, which is about uh, refugee rights, and it's about um, and being very upfront about that. And, and fighting back that populist uh, narrative. But it's a hard battle because, um, well, as I said before, the justice issue in climate justice also is in the Netherlands. And the people who are most impacted in the Netherlands about climate, uh, for example, high energy prices, 
are being led to believe that uh, have migration is the cause of all problems economically in the Netherlands, which is exactly uh, the populist uh, rhetoric that we should fight against. Yeah, I fully agree. Uh, we have a tendency to make issues into politics, which are actually not political issues. Climate, the climate crisis is not a political matter. It's a matter of fact that affects us all. And um, I think besides using our voices in parliament to expose that kind of hypocrisy, because I think it's hypocrisy, um, I think what we also, what helps a, l a lot is to show that, as you say, what happens in Africa, what happens everywhere in the world happens in Europe. So to constantly bring the discussions uh, about Dutch politics back to Dutch politics is world politics. And if we don't recognize that, we will only increase our own problems further. Um, and I think in addition to that, um, you uh, mentioned, uh, you, you spoke about uh, court cases. That helps a lot. And I think we should fully support that from uh, as politicians as well, because once a court case is uh, finalized and you have a judge saying, this is actually something that's consensual and, and holds a country accountable, that helps us depoliticize the topic. And I think that is what all our efforts should be aimed at. Politics is the best way to uh, sort of um, ensure that we don't solve the problem, to make it political. So we need to depoliticize the climate and uh, climate justice. All right, thank you. I think we we're seven minutes over time now. <laughs> uh, so I want to uh, end here, but maybe a last call to action from Miranda. Is there, If there's one thing you would want to say to the Dutch audience here, what is it? As I said earlier, climate change is happening with all of us, world leaders, donors, civil society, government at all levels, communities, families, and most importantly, children must act now. No one should be left out. We need to protect our environment. We can do this in various ways. Planting trees to reduce the greenhouse effects. Galvanize stakeholders to join hands and have a unified voice. And action on climate change. The climate crisis is affecting our collective life and survival. All hands should be on deck to protect everyone, most especially children, towards ensuring they can attain their full potential. I therefore call on the government of the Netherlands and the international communities to support countries and communities affected by climate crisis to improve their livelihood and clean up their environment. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, audience, for being here and participating. Uh, very much appreciated. I hope you come out of this session inspired. Thank you so much to our panelists here, uh, Eva, Suzanne, and Marika. Good luck with the last day of uh, campaigning. Uh, and especially uh, a huge thank you to Miranda and Aminata. And now it's time for lunch. <laughs>